Good morning, flexible diet and training hacks. It is Yusuf here and I'm joined by my spirit animal, Bert, today. Now, I was going to do this video as we always do in our weekly VIP client Q&A video, but this was a question from one of our clients and I thought, you know what, you guys need to know about this as well. He basically works as a solicitor and he was really struggling with overwhelm and just not knowing where to start with diet and training. He was like, look, I just want to turn up and train and I don't want to have to faff around with tracking macros and getting to grips with all this complex stuff. Just tell me what to do. So I think this is well worth uh, going over for you guys as well. So I've called this the minimalist just turn up method. If you have any questions as we go along, post in the comments and I will get to you. So the problems that you may face, and maybe you're in the same position as this guy, is general sense of overwhelm. There's a bunch of tennis balls being flung at you and you've only got two rackets and it's terrible. So maybe you've only got the time to just go to the gym and execute and nothing else. And, you know, it's, it's actually quite a useful feedback for us as well because it made us realise that, yeah, not everyone is a fitness melt. Not everyone wants to dedicate that much time and mental space to this stuff. They just want to turn up and know what to do. And so even the level of tracking and um, macros and progression and all that stuff, although it's stuff that if you've been training for some time, you're very au fait with, maybe you're, you're not ready to get to that level yet. So what can we do instead? Well, the first thing is to identify that one of the problems that we have is that the existing habit loops that we may have could be detrimental to our progress. And most likely they are because you wouldn't be in this position right now if it wasn't for the sum total of all of your habits up until this point. And that's all that we are as people. We are just the sum total of all of our past behaviors and that has led us to this point. So actually breaking those existing habit loops can be more important than creating new positive ones. But we'll get to that in a second. The next thing is also that, oh, I feel like I haven't got time. Now, this is something that's important to clarify and it may well be that you don't have time, but clarify, is the bottleneck really time or is it headspace? Because these two things have very different solutions. If it is time, then you've got to ask, is your life really your own? If you can't dedicate 30 minutes twice a week to, to yourself, then maybe we need to reorganize some of your priorities in your life. Um, as far as the pure physical time constraint goes, I don't always buy that. I have very rarely see somebody who is more busy than me. I'm obviously doing a medical degree, involves lots of time in a distant hospital every day, plus running a business at Propane Fitness. So um, I think if you haven't, if you've got more commitments than that, you know, kids and family and two jobs and, and so on, then yeah, certainly. And that's something we need to look at in terms of how can we manage time without sacrificing sleep or mental health. Now, headspace, we'll get on to. Now, principles, these are the main things that we need to bear in mind if we want to adopt a minimal just turn up approach to training. The first thing is you want to be able to set things on cruise control as much as possible. Yes, there's a little bit of initial setup, but once that's on, we want to be able to just run through your day on automatic and for those behaviors and things that will take you towards your physique goal to just unfold automatically as they do. And actually, a lot of the time, this will generate a positive return on investment with your time. It's often one of the biggest uh, uh, obstacles that people see or objections of, oh, well, if I haven't got time now, I'm never going to find it. And um, it's just not something that's going to work for me. But if you were to actually start optimizing some of these behaviors in your life and develop a cruise control approach, you may actually find that it generates more time for you. Why is that? First of all, if you're training more frequently, you're gonna have a better concentration span, your energy is going to be higher and more stable throughout the day. You're not gonna be having to rely on, on coffee and um, excessive caffeine and that kind of thing to as pick me ups. And you will also just generally be more focused and more emotionally stable in your life. There's a huge number of benefits to exercise from a neurochemical perspective. I won't go into them now, but your neuroplasticity. So if you're ever in, if you're a knowledge worker or a student or something where you need to memorize things more effectively, exercise will always give you a positive return on that much more. In fact, the data shows this where <clears throat> they got kids to either spend three hours studying or one hour studying followed by um, running around the park or something and then going back to it. 
and the exercise group recalled more than if they just studied all the way through. Really interesting stuff. So uh, another example actually is after coming off the meditation retreat last year, I did a 10 day meditation retreat and they, they say, oh, you should really, when you go home, you should meditate for two hours a day. And I'm thinking, that's ridiculous. No way I can manage two hours a day of meditation in my already hectic schedule. And they were like, well, you'll sleep an hour less and you'll be an hour more productive. You're like, bollocks, like there is no excuse now. So in those situations, it really just comes down to a matter of discipline. But if you already break even on the time commitment, it's a no brainer. Next thing, minimizing mental RAM. So RAM, if you are not uh, computer literate, is the number of, so let's say you've got 20 tabs open on your, on your browser and the computer starts to slow down. There's too much going on. There's too many open loops in your head. And so everything, the whole system starts to slow down. Instead, we want to be able to minimize the amount of headspace that we're dedicating towards thinking about food, thinking about our physique, thinking about, oh, I haven't gone to the gym yet, etc. We want it to be as automatic and on cruise control as possible. Maybe you've got a busy job and you haven't got time. We've just talked about that. Um, and the way to approach this is to keep the momentum going, even if it's during a work push. So if you have a big project coming up, then we want to have these principles in place so that you're able to keep things moving while other parts of your life are big in focus at the moment. Now for habits, check out Habits 101, that's in our VIP members area, that covers the specifics and the anatomy of a habit, how to break bad ones and how to establish new ones. And remember, they are two separate skills and they're both equally important. Imagine if you were to stop just, if you were to, without making any new habits, if you were just to stop doing the things that you know that you shouldn't be doing and you picked one of those things every six months and you just stopped doing it forever. Imagine how much further your life would be if that were the case. Habit stacking. So this is a nice little book by S.J. Scott. There's many good ones that uh, if you if you want any more recommendations, let me know in the comments below. But um, being able to stack habits is key. So you probably already have some habit stacks. You wake up, you brush your teeth, you pour a coffee, you sit down, you maybe read the paper, you, whatever it is. But that's a series of things like a chain reaction where you start one thing and then each one just automatically kicks off from the previous one. So these are really important to um, be able to tag on the end and then eventually it just becomes one single starting habit and everything else just follows automatically. If you're not sure on the goal that you want to be taking, and this was something that this guy had a problem with, he was saying, well, I don't necessarily want to be massive and shredded I you know I, I'm not I haven't got that much interest in it and I know the relative cost of doing so now I would agree and there is often a large cost to getting massive and shredded but this guy is called Ian he was very busy he was working a, working a, he a hectic job with a busy social life and uh, studying for some professional exams same with this guy James so both of these were clients of mine and ultimately, they've lost fat and they've gained muscle. Who doesn't want less fat and more muscle? So I would argue that although not everyone wants to look like a bodybuilder, everyone fundamentally has bodybuilding goals because we all want to be leaner or with more muscle. Even if it's used in, the, like often women will tend to use the phrase more toned, but ultimately that comes down to improving body composition. So these two guys are fantastic examples because they didn't give any thought to macros. They just set things on cruise control and over time, without having to really dedicate much effort to it or energy, they turned out with some fantastic progress. And they've gone from um, being sort of 20, 25% body fat to actively quite lean. Remember, if you're not sure on which one to take first, then go with fat loss first, then muscle gain. So increase the level of detail as required rather than um, trying to do both at the same time. So what, I, what do I mean by increasing detail? I'm talking about daily weigh-ins, weekly photos, measurements, strength progress. And so all these kind of more granular levels of tracking, you can always add in further down the line if things start to slow down. But the key thing is just starting at this point. Now, <clears throat> I would recommend taking an initial photo now, even if you don't show it to anyone, just take a front and back photo with good lighting, topless, just so that you have a marker of where you're at right now. Come back in three months time and look back at it and I guarantee 
that is going to be so much more of a motivation than looking in the mirror because the mirror you always change in a very slow way you're not always going to recognize those changes that happen to you day to day but looking at that photo that is a distinct static picture of where you were at a certain time ago and you can compare and you're like wow I've actually come a lot further than I expected next use your commute you very likely if you're a busy person you will have a lot of downtime that or dead time that you're not able to make use of actively use the commute to go through some mp3 audios if you obviously if you're part of our members area then you want to use the the audios there just listen to them in the background you can play them on double speed if you want i won't be offended um listen to the propane podcast there's a lot of free content in there we really give away quite a lot of good stuff for free on our website because we know that um, we want to be able to help you guys as much as possible. Book Player is a great app that is for iPhone and Android, I think. Um, if you just search Book Player, you can basically import MP3s from your computer and it will automatically sync into your phone. You can play them on any speed that you like. You can set a sleep timer, so before you go to bed you can just set it on 10 minutes and then as you drift off to sleep it turns off. The other great app is called Media Human MP3 YouTube Converter, so if you have any kind of lectures on YouTube that you want to listen to, download them on there so you literally just copy the link and it puts it into your itunes so these are all fantastic tools to really make use of that dead time but i would recommend number one is if this is something that you're serious about listen to the modules that we have in the members area on mp3 during your commute you'll bash through them within a week or two and by that point you've suddenly upgraded yourself on all counts next diet so some untrack hacks that you can use these are some tips that you can use for your diet if you don't want to be tracking things on my fitness pal or whatever or you're overwhelmed by the whole process number one eliminate the possibility of fucking up this is key because if you make the bad decisions as difficult as possible and the good decisions as easy as possible then it just re eliminates that friction between what you should be doing and what you are doing and then suddenly they become the same thing you're on cruise control you're flying towards your goal options so you can do either two fasts a week, that means coffee, water, diet drinks, green tea, that kind of thing, That you, so calorie-free drinks that you're allowed during that time, and those fasts would be basically 20 hours. That means, say, you wake up until 8 p.m., so you have your uh, pre-bed meal, 8 p.m., for example, and that should be around 500 calories. That's just basically a single portion meal. Um, you don't need to track it necessarily, but if you get an idea of what a 500 calorie meal looks looks like, that will certainly um, help things along. Basically, it's a regular size meal. Don't take the piss. 16-8 fasting. This is another way that you can approach things. So rather than having two fasts a week, instead we have the same schedule every day. But you see the green bar here? That is the time that you're eating each day. So let's say you have your breakfast at midday, 12 p.m., and then you have your last meal by 8 p.m. That means you've got an eight hour eating window and then the rest of the time during the day is fasting. Luckily, most of that time is sleeping anyway, so it's not a huge problem. It just means that you might just have your breakfast a little bit later and your supper a little bit earlier and then you've, you've restricted it to an eight hour eating window. Doing this is really helpful because you'll feel so much fuller when you're eating because you've got a minimal window, so you're eating larger meals per meal, but there's no sense of deprivation and when you're fasting you're just off the food's just off the cards and you're a bit more productive as well because you're not having to worry about when is your next meal next approach you can do if you don't want to bother with fasting you can do the hunger buster diet so check out propanefitness.com forward slash hunger this is a valuable article that i spent a flipping a long time writing about managing satiety that is the sense of fullness between meals now, a few hacks that you can use, but read the full article for, for the full thing. There's also an MP3 version, which you can put on audio book player and listen to it on your commute. But some things would be replace your carb sources with potato. When I say potato, I don't mean chips. I mean just potato. Uh, that is much more filling, much more satisfying. And it's shown in the evidence to reduce the amount of calorie intake that people eat subsequently. Cauliflower, another great one. You can... You can eat a whole head of cauliflower, put it in a blender, make some cauliflower rice with that. Protein and vegetables. So whenever you have your meal on a plate, just simply eat the protein and vegetable part of it first. That way, at least you're filled up on the stuff that is higher in volume, lower in calorie dense, uh, low calorie density. And then if you do still have some hunger left over, then you can start eating into the carbs. 
That way you're just re mitigating the calories that you're eating without much of a problem. Finally, slow eating. So set a 20 minute timer that means that you can't start pudding until 20 minutes after you finished your main. That way at least you allow those neurochemical signals to allow yourself to feel full. You might even find that 20 minutes later you actually aren't that hungry and maybe if you crammed the pudding in too early you overshot and then you feel more full than you should have been. You're like, oh, I wish I hadn't eaten that pudding. So that's another great tip that you can use. Next thing is realizing that hunger and fat loss are kind of tied together. And that's just the way our body works as the evolutionary response to being underfed. So we need to get comfortable with the fact that we're always going to be a bit hungry. That's okay, because when you do that, you can actually use it as a way to gauge how much fat am I losing? Am I on the right track? I'm sure you've heard that glib quote, uh, hunger is fat leaving the body. It's kind of true. So if you always eat to a seven out of 10, then that's going to be really helpful for knowing where you're at roughly with your calories without ever having to worry about um, what are my calories at and did I track everything on my on my phone. So eat to a sense of fullness that's about seven out of 10. You don't have to completely deprive yourself, but just always leave a little bit on the table, literally. Final thing is tracking in 250 calorie blocks. So if you have a good idea of what 250 calories looks like, you can treat it like points. So you say, I'm allowed 10 points a day. That's 2,250. Um, no, it's not. It's 2,500. So maybe that's a bit high for you. Maybe it's a bit low, whatever. But um, set things in, in those blocks. And then if you're not losing weight beyond two weeks of daily weigh-ins, you can then adjust by saying, oh, I'm going to reduce the number of points that I can eat per day. It's very much the way that uh, systems like Weight Watchers and um, what's that other one called? Uh, Slimming World, those kind of things use, they have a point system. It's basically calorie tracking, but divided by 10. So it's a bit simpler to do. Finally, meal prep. Meal prep is so important. I cannot get over how much of an improvement meal prep will make to your life and to making things just as automatic as possible. So this is about automating your diet. If you get a slow cooker or an instant pot, which is the thing that I use, it will just, you stick everything in the cooker at the start of the week on a Sunday. It literally takes two minutes. You don't have to have any kind of culinary experience. Bung it all in, set it so that it's either hot uh, when you come back from work or um, set it overnight or whatever. And then you can just put it into little Tupperware then you've got your meal sorted, you come home, you don't have to worry about raiding the cupboards or cooking something from scratch. You've got it all made and ready for you. And because you made that decision ahead of time when you're in a clear mental space, you then were able to choose a meal that is low in calorie density and that will hit your goals, that will actually move you towards your physique goal. Cool, so a lot of good stuff in here. So we've got the diet hacks for not tracking, making sure that you're using your commute and the principles that we're using here for the minimal training approach, the just turn up method. Next and final thing we have is training. So this is often where a lot of people stumble. Resist the temptation to train at home. Resist the temptation to train at home, seriously. It requires an inordinate amount of discipline to be able to train consistently at home because your bed's next n nearby and then there's the sofa nearby and you, you can always go and check some emails or whatever. So it's very difficult. If you've ever trained at home, you'll know this, to complete a session when you have no delineation between where you are and the sofa. So most people who request a home training program, often it comes from a place of avoidance. It's like, oh, I don't really want to commit to this. And so really examine your intention here and say, hang on, I do not want to be one of those people. I'm going to go to a separate gym, just like um, trying to... If, uh, you know, you remember when you were a student and you had to, if you went to the library to, to work, it was so much better because you're in a fresh environment, you get it done and you want to get home. So you, you, you get the work done, you leave. Whereas if you sat at home, it's too easy to just kind of bleed into the day and just not really just do a lot of pseudo work and that kind of thing. And the same thing applies with training. Next, we have joining a gym. So have a dedicated place that you can go to time box so you set yourself 45 minutes or an hour while you're in there in the building to get what needs to get done it serves as a great mental reset as well and also if you want to reward yourself 
Join a gym with a sauna or a pool, and then you have something to look forward to at the end of each session. Combine it into the work day. So either pre-work, at lunchtime, or on the way back from work. Don't fall into the trap of thinking you've got to finish work, go home, get changed, go back out to the gym, and then come home. It's not only a waste of time, but it, it's so easy once you get into the door to just be like, oh, I just want to lie down now. <clears throat> I've had enough. So keep the momentum going while you're out of the house. Next, training program. So I would recommend training two times a week. If you're somebody that is too busy to establish a, a, a kind of more full training program, like the ones in the propane protocol, which you can download in the members area, then twice a week is all you need as the minimum effective dose. Obviously, you will still get increasing returns going up from there, up to about five times a week, and then it starts to drop off. Now, each session can last about 30 minutes, and the key principle for each session is to have one push, one pull, and one legs. That is a push movement, so horizontal or vertical, a pull movement, horizontal or vertical, and a legs movement. So some examples modeled by the beautiful Johnny is the bench press and an overhead press. I think if you have both of those movements or some variation of, that could mean a chest press or a dumbbell overhead press or a seated overhead press, something like that. For the pull, do a horizontal and a vertical pull. So a row such as this, chest supported row, or a pull up. And then for legs, we want to have a squat, some form of deadlift. Here I'm doing a Romanian deadlift where the hamstrings are a bit more stretched. Um, slightly easier for some people to get into the, the technique of, but check out all the technique videos in the members area as well. And a lunge. This is a, Roma a Bulgarian, <laughs> Bulgarian uh, split squat. So many Eastern European names there. So there's lots of variations of this that you can try as well. Remember, check out the technique guide in the members area. If you want a free program um, that's not ours, then I would recommend the Strong Lift 5x5 program. It does require some comfort with full body barbell movements. So if you're not used to them, then follow one of ours instead with the technique guides. But this is very good as well. 5x5, five five, so you basically start light, add 2.5 kilos each week. And the 5x5 five five approach works for all of these as well. Basically start with an empty bar, do five sets of five, and when you hit all sets of five, then next week you add 2.5 kilos to the bar and continue. That's a 1.25 on each side. And that's it guys. So I hope that was useful. Um, for more on this and also a full program that uh, you can download, go to probeinfitness.com forward slash dieting for the busy or lazy man. This is a spreadsheet that I've written out that takes all of these principles that I've discussed and puts them into a sheet for you so you can have an overview of your progress, both with the different approaches to diet as well as training. Okay, so that is it for the minimalist just turn up training method.